Law School. Professor Helmholtz earned his A.D. from Princeton University in French literature and his Ph.D. in medieval history from the University of California at Berkeley. Professor Humboldt's teaching interests have centered on legal, uh, on natural resources law and property law, and his research interests have concentrated on legal history. And with that, please give a warm Illinois welcome to our guest today. <laughs> Carl, I am very impressed with your having memorized all of that. You're on your way to being a very successful litigator. Um, it's great to be back here at Chicago. And I want to thank uh, Professor Helmholtz uh, for agreeing to comment. Uh, it's often difficult for Fed Sock chapters to get a professor to sally forth and do commentary. Uh, professor Helmholtz and I were on a panel together back in 2015 at the Cato Institute, uh, where we had an all-day conference on the 800th anniversary of Magna Carta. And so we were on the, pan the opening panel together for that. So it's good to be back with you. Now, uh, I am going to be talking about uh, why is it the court cannot get the judicial protection of unenumerated rights right. Uh, this is an extraordinarily uh, uh, problematic area of constitutional law. Um, Professor Helen Holtz and I will only be able to scratch the surface of this. Uh, our hope, and I'm sure I speak for Professor Helmholtz in this, is that we at least stimulate your thought to, uh, to greater inquiry into this subject, because it is one that vexes uh, the court and, uh, and many of us, especially uh, the um, legal uh, uh, organizations on our side, uh, the Pacific Legal Foundation in particular, uh, we at Cato in our amicus briefs and so forth. Um, I'm going to start with um, a just quick overview of some recent history in this area, very quick. Um, and then I'm going to uh, set forth my answer to the question, why is it the court can't get it right? Uh, and then I'm going to devote most of my attention to the uh, history of the matter which will take us back to Magna Carta, among other things, which I'll just glance over. But uh, it's in that history that I think uh, you're going to find the answer to the question. Now, the, so let's start with the very recent history, by which I mean the post-New Deal constitutional revolution, whereby the court deferred to the political branches largely until the middle of the 1950s, when it got its second win, and it began uh, it began finding rights uh, that were uh, long uh, overdue for being found, but uh, also other rights that led to a conservative backlash, uh, charging the Warren and Berger courts with judicial activism, uh, the, Demo uh, the uh, conservatives calling on the court to be deferential to the political branches, uh, and so we had two schools of thought, both of them wrong. Um, and when, you, when I saw this situation, when I was doing my doctorate across the midway here, uh, I thought to myself uh, that the pox on both your houses, uh, Richard Epstein here uh, at, the, at the law school took the same view. Uh, we were just two of a very few number of people, Bernie Segan out at the University of San Diego, um, Harry Jaffa, the inimitable Harry Jaffa at Claremont College, um, who uh, were saying that uh, neither the conservatives nor the liberals got the issue right. And what you found was that um, uh, basically, uh, when an issue of unenumerated rights came before the court, usually in the context of a challenge to a state statute, uh, the issue was decided under the 14th Amendment's substantive due process. And that led to conservatives uh, rebelling against that whole idea of uh, substantive due process. In particular, uh, uh, you had uh, people like uh, Anthony Scalia and Robert Bork who were in the forefront of that. Uh, the 
view that I have come to on this, and here's the conclusion that I see, that I'm going to just drop with you now before I start defending it, yeah, is that the whole issue of judicial protection of unenumerated rights, uh, in particular through the 14th Amendment and the 9th Amendment, has been wrongly framed. It is framed in the sense that the defendant, or the plaintiff rather, has to find a right in the Constitution, uh, that gets it exactly backwards. You read the Constitution properly, and it falls to the government to justify its restraint, uh, which leads to the uh, litigation in the first place. And so it shifts the burden of proof to government, rather than on the plaintiff to show whether he can find such a right in the Constitution. All right. The problem then is the misframing ultimately of the issue because of a misframing and misunderstanding of the Constitution as being essentially designed to uh, ensure democratic decision making such that it prejudices uh, the uh, democratic uh, version of the Constitution over the libertarian version of the so to get that, you've got to, and here I join Abraham Lincoln and the 39th Congress that gave us the 14th Amendment, you've got to go back to the Declaration of Independence because as they held, you cannot understand the Constitution correctly unless you read it through the frame of the Declaration of Independence. So there is where we start, and you cannot understand the Declaration of Independence unless you understand the theory of rights that underpins it, which is what I addressed my work to in my dissertation across the street. And so, let's begin with the Declaration, and we see in the first, in the first paragraph, Jefferson uh, pl uh, declares our independence to a candid world, to the powers of the earth, and he does so by pointing to the laws of nature and of nature's God. That theocratic invocation uh, should not be overstated, and you see that in the very first sentence of the next most famous paragraph. Uh, we hold these truths to be self-evident. Self-evident truths are grounded in reason, uh, available to all people at all times and all places. So it is rationally based, not theologically based, when you read it in that context. And so what you notice when you uh, look at it that way is that the appeal to natural law, more precisely to the natural rights strain of natural law, they are very different traditions. When you appeal to the natural law tradition, you're appealing to the idea that there's a higher law of right and wrong from which you derive the actual law and against which to criticize that law at any point in time. And there's nothing extraordinary about that. Uh, Pache, uh, Holmes, and his uh, talk of mysterious omnipresence in the sky. This is something that was understood from the, and from the ancients onward. You look at Plato's Euthyphro, and you find a debate between uh, young Euthyphro and old Socrates over the meaning of piety and impiety and, and science. Euthyphro, being young and quite full of himself, like most young men, uh, proceeded to uh, instruct old Socrates, and Socrates uh, regularly uh, instructed Euthyphro that he really didn't know what he was talking about. And so we get to the ultimate uh, question, is piety pious because the gods love it, or do the gods love it because it's pious? In other words, an implicit distinction between uh, legal positivism, a will-based theory of legitimacy, and natural law grounded in reason. This we see uh, carried out in, uh, in part in uh, Aristotle's Nicophian Ethics. Uh, when we turn to the Stoics uh, after the demise of the Greek city-states, we see the appeal to universal principles, again, common to all people at all times, grounded in reason. In the Roman law, we find the reduction of this to property and contract, property broadly understood as Locke would define it. 
Uh, and we see in the Roman uh, Senator Seneca an invocation of a rudimentary notion of state of nature theory, which will occur again in the 17th century with Hobbes and Locke. In the Middle Ages, you see the struggle between Pope and King and the emergence of rudimentary notions of separations of power, separation, separate jurisdictions. But it's when we turn to the common law of England that we see the theory of rights start to unfold. In the, sec the third quarter of the second uh, uh, of the uh, 12th century, um, uh, Henry II uh, creates a uh, system of courts uh, and a, an appellate court, and we start to see cases brought before those courts by ordinary individuals, ordinary subjects against their neighbor, and later on uh, against the king, um, and it start to develop a theory of rights grounded in property, contract, custom, and the like, uh, which would be drawn together from time to time in the various iterations of Magna Carta, starting in 1215, which can be thought of as kind of quasi-constitutions. Con, uh, but it's when we get to John Locke in the late uh, 16th century, 17th century, that is all drawn together with a theory of rights, a theory, natural rights theory of property, and a social contract theory. Uh, this is what Jefferson was drawing upon when he drafted the Declaration. So we get to that famous second paragraph, and we see that it starts with all men are created equal. Obviously, they didn't mean that literally. They meant equal with reference to our rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So he's invoking by implication there a rule of parsimony. You want to start with the simplest premise. If someone wants to claim rights superior to those of another, then it falls upon him to show that, failing which we come to the simpler premise, namely that uh, all, we're all created with equal rights. And then you start to do the casualty. I'm not going to go into the epistemological foundations of that. That is the subject for another day, indeed for another semester. Uh, what I'm going to do is just give you the, the sort of taxonomy uh, of rights. You start with a right, a general right to liberty, because that is the right that can be universalized. And what you want to do when you're doing state of nature theory, which is exactly what the Declaration's second paragraph is about, it starts by setting forth the moral order and then the political and legal order that follows from the moral order. So state of nature theory, you don't have to believe that anything like this ever existed. It's a thought experiment, which is designed to, uh, to show how you can, from a state of affairs without government, get clear about what our rights and obligations are vis-a-vis -vis each other, so that you will know what rights we have to bring into being and to empower a government. You don't want to start with the government because you want to avoid circularity. And again, you're also talking about a rule of parsimony. And so when you do that, you start to determine what is our first ba basic right. And it turns out, as I said, to be a right to be left alone, to not have anything that belongs free and clear to us to be taken from us. That is a perfectly universalizable right in the sense that we can all enjoy it at the same time and in the same respect as everyone else is enjoying it as well. But we don't spend our lives living in splendid isolation on Black Acre or White Acre. We come together and so we have the second great thought of rights, namely uh, uh, tort uh, or contract. Uh, in other words, these are the two ways in which you can extinguish general rights to freedom and bring into being new special rights and obligations between the special parties to the event that brought them into being. So now we have the two fundamental building blocks of the theory of rights, general rights and obligations, all of which are variations of liberty, and special rights and obligations that arise in virtue of the events that happen in the world. When we look at this world of general rights and obligations, we can see that Reason can carry us a good ways down the road. It can address, for example, competitive situations whereby someone is harmed, so to speak, by a competitive context. But it turns out that no rights are violated in those. For example, 
if I have a home with a lovely uh, view of the bay, and uh, you decide to build a second story on your home, which is situated between me and the bay, and it blocks my view and reduces the value of my home, have you violated my right? No. Why? Because the view is not anything I ever owned. I enjoyed it because it ran over your property. I'm invoking here the Lord Cook's odd coelum rule, whereby you own from the nadir to the zenith, from the center of the earth in straight lines. Uh, and so what you find is that when you invoke principles like this, you can sort out various general relationships to liberty. But eventually you're going to run out of principles, and you're going to have to turn to values. And there's a fundamental distinction between rights and values. They come from different domains of morality, as the Oxford jurisprudent H.L.A. Hart has put it. Uh, the, uh, what, uh, uh, what uh, is valuable to you is not necessarily valuable to me. There's subjectivity in, in values, objectivity in rights. I'll get to that point in just a moment. But what you find is that when you get to areas like uh, nuisance, risk, remedies, and enforcement, you're dealing with areas in which reasonable people can have reasonable differences. So it's important to distinguish those areas of the theory of rights where you can get apodictic principles of right and wrong about which we all must agree on pain ultimately of self-contradiction, and those other areas where reasonable people can have reasonable differences. And once you do that, then you will have a way to address one of the classic epistemological problems we've inherited from antiquity, namely the distinction between skepticism and dogmatism. Skepticism holds that there are no moral truths, or if there are, we can't know them. Dogmatism holds that there are moral truths pertaining to every aspect of the human condition, what sexual practices you can engage in, what you can smoke or put in your bodies, what uh, the role of women shall be uh, in society. Think of some of the draconian codes in various places in the world today. And so when you distinguish those two, you find that you've got a pair of approaches to ethics and morality that are unattractive because skepticism gives you no morality, nothing to get hold of, dogmatism gives you no freedom. So if you can distinguish these two and chart a course between them, you will have objectivity in morality with respect to your rights and subjectivity in your uh, exercise of those rights, the values you pursue, the things that make you happy. So when Jefferson was speaking, about the uh, right to pursue happiness, he was touching upon a fundamental insight that is essential to the classical liberal view of the world. Objectivity in rights, subjectivity in values. And that is the kind of uh, foundation that you need going forth to do your casuistry on the theory of rights. Now, when you do it, you will find that people do have a right to bring into being the uh, instruments that will enable them to secure their rights. Uh, but it turns out it's very difficult to justify that. In fact, when you get to that second part of the declaration, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just power from the consent of the governed. There you see that the theory of political legitimacy is rooted in both reason to give us our rights and consent to bring into being the powers that are necessary to secure those rights. Why do we need government? I address this to any anarchist that there may be out there. I deal with them all the time at the Cato Institute. <laughs> these, these are people uh, who think that we can get by without government. The problem is that one, once we get to an impasse whereby we are not in a situation such as one in which we can not reach an agree a contract agreement and walk away. Here we can't do that. If there has been a wrong alleged, then either that wrong will not get addressed or we will resort to force to, uh, to address it. And that means that we need to move to some institution 
that will enable us to address this very real problem in the state of nature. And we do that through consent, except, of course, that we don't. Because when you look at the theory of legitimacy from political consent, you find that, first of all, it's fine if you have unanimity, but when do you ever have unanimity? And so the social contract theory says we all agree in the original position to be bound thereafter by some uh, fraction of the, uh, of the whole, usually a majority, uh, or sometimes a supermajority. That's not going to work. Why? Because, of course, none of us was there in the original position. You've got the problem of succeeding generations. So the last refuge of the small d Democrat is through tacit consent. That is to say, uh, we, uh, we stayed, therefore, by implication, we're bound. Well, that's not going to work either, because it's tantamount to the majorities uh, putting us to a choice either to leave or to come under its rule, precisely what the majority has to justify on pain of, uh, of circularity. And so when you do this little thought experiment, considering consent as the foundation for political legitimacy, you come up with a striking and very important conclusion, namely that there is an air of illegitimacy that surrounds government as such. It's a forced association. It's unlike General Motors of the Baptist Church or the Boy Scouts, which you can join and leave at will. It is a forced association. And once you recognize that, it behooves you to do as little as necessary through government, where it will be done in violation of the rights of those who want no part of it, think Obamacare, uh, and uh, as much as possible in the private sector, where it can be done in violation of the rights of no one. And so now we've got a way to look at government. We've got a presumption against government and a burden of proof of those who want to do something through government to do it uh, uh, as little as possible and to justify doing it. And so we can come up with three fundamental powers of government by way of thinking more uh, systematically about it. Uh, in descending orders of legitimacy, there is first of all the police power, uh, which is the fundamental power we give up to government to secure our rights and to provide us with a few other public goods as economists understand them uh, with reference to the uh, free rider problem, uh, goods uh, as distinguished from private goods because they exhibit the qualities of, of uh, non-excludability and non-rivalrous consumption. I, I trust the University of Chicago. I don't have to explain those terms to you. You are all steeped in law and economics and Pareto superiority and optimality, are you not? And so, and so uh, when you, you now have um, a basic power, which includes regulation, I might add, to flesh out our rights, to tell us, for example, where the line is in nuisance, how much risk we can put our neighbor to before we violate his rights, uh, what remedies are appropriate, because the, obviously tort feasors will value the loss he caused low, and victims will value it high. Uh, with respect to uh, enforcement, if you're in a state of nature and you come home and find your house has been burglarized? Can you go out on the highway and stop every suspect you run into? Can you uh, put him on the rack? Can you pull out the thumb screw to see if he is the one who would burgle your home? In other words, what process is due him? What process is due you? It cuts both ways, obviously. These are value judgments. There's no accident. The Fourth Amendment has the words unreasonable and probable. Those are value words. Okay, now, the second great power of government is eminent domain, the power to condemn private property for public use without just, with just compensation. As Professor Helmholtz has written a great deal in the area of property, and so have I, we understand that principle. It was understood as the, um, uh, in the 17th century as the uh, uh, despotic power. Why? Because unlike the police power, which is more legitimate, which is, in virtue of its being a power each of us had in the state of nature to secure his own rights. None of us could condemn his neighbor's property, even if we did put it to better use and gave him just compensation. 
And so it is less legitimate for that reason. Uh, the best we can say is that it is Pareto superior. At least one person is made better off, no one is made worse off, provided the owner gets just compensation, which rarely, of course, happens. Just compensation would be that amount that would leave him indifferent as to whether he keeps the property or uh, gets the compensation. The third great power of government is the redistributive power, and it is the least legitimate at all, of all, because it entails in its various forms taking from A and giving to B, either literally in the form of taxation for various redistributive programs or regulatory uh, redistribution in the form of prohibiting someone from doing what he otherwise has a right to do or, or, or uh, requiring him to do what he otherwise has a right not to do for the benefit of B. And yet this, of course, this third power of government is what most governments are involved in most of the time today. And so we can conclude this part of it by thinking of a continuum. Down here is anarchism. Up here is totalitarianism. Think of North Korea. Down here, we are at the anarchist state, the most free, at least with respect to government. But, as I've said, there are practical problems in the state of nature with each of us enforcing his own rights and therefore creating risk for others who are inclined to say, uh, we're going to force you out of the state of nature uh, because we will all be better off if we had a single power enforcing our rights. And if that is the case that we are all better off, then who could disagree about entering into such an arrangement. So we move up a little bit where we have government providing us with various public goods such as law enforcement, national defense, clean uh, uh, air and water, uh, certain limited infrastructure and so forth. Once you move beyond that <coughs> and you start bringing in public education, dare I say in today's world, public education, um, national public radio, all things considered, <laughs> and, and other kinds of programs like this, you will have more and more people dropping off the consent scale and saying, I'd rather not be involved in private and public education. I'd rather keep my money and send my kid to a school of my own choice. Until you get right up here at the far end, and there you have, uh, uh, you have choice falling off because once you object, you find yourself in a very parlous situation if you can even get out of the country uh, about which you are objecting to. By the way, I know Cato Institute just awarded its Friedman Prize yesterday to Jimmy Lai. So he's going to be recognized this year. But I digress. Um, all right, now we're ready to move back into the Constitution. And you, what I'm going to do is look at the preamble, the first sentence of Article 1, Article 1, Section 8, and then the Ninth and Tenth Amendments. Put all of that together, and you have got the kind of vision, a theory of the Constitution, that will help us to think about the Fourteenth Amendment and the Ninth Amendment. The preamble starts, we the people, for the purposes listed, to ordain and establish this Constitution. In other words, we're right back in the state of nature. All power starts with the people. They give the government whatever powers, it, they first of all, create the government, give it such powers as they do. The government does not give us our rights. We already have our rights, the exercise of which allows us to bring government into being and to empower. And then you look at the first sentence, all legislative powers herein granted shall be vested in a Congress. By implication, not all power was herein granted. Look at Article 1, Section 8, and you will see that Congress has only 18 legislative powers. And then you look at the Ninth and Tenth Amendments, which is a recapitulation of the philosophy that was first set forth in the Declaration. And you see, starting with the Tenth Amendment, the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution or prohibited by it to the states are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. In the Tenth Amendment, you see the Federalism Amendment, namely that the government, federal government has only those 18 legislative powers. 
The rest belonged to the states or to the people never having been given to either level of government. And then you look at the Ninth Amendment. The enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. Retained by the people, notice you can't retain what you don't first have to be retained. And what are those? They were alluding to the natural rights that we never gave up when we left the state of nature and entered into, state, into the state of civil society. In other words, we're talking here state of nature theory as a theory of political and legal legitimacy. Okay, now, the Ninth Amendment came about, if its history is instructive, because it tells you why it's there. During the ratification, first of all, at the end of the convention, uh, a proposal for a Bill of Rights was introduced, but uh, it went nowhere. But during the ratification debates, it became clear that a Bill of Rights would have to be uh, added or the Constitution would not be ratified. But there were objections to a Bill of Rights. Uh, people like Hamilton, uh, Wilson, uh, uh, Sherman, and others said a Bill of Rights would be unnecessary and it would be dangerous. Unnecessary because why declare that there is freedom of speech, said Hamilton, when no power is given with which to violate the freedom of speech? Notice they were taking the doctrine of enumerated powers as implicit in uh, the very first sentence of Article 1 and as made clear in Article 1, Section 8, and as recapitulated in the Tenth Amendment, they were taking the doctrine of enumerated powers where there is no power by definition, there is a right, seriously. And so what you have here is the, uh, is the start of the argument. Moreover, they said it would be dangerous to have a Bill of Rights. Why? Because by ordinary principles of legal construction, the failure to enumerate all members of a category will be understood as saying that those members are to be protected in contradistinction from those that are not uh, to be protected. Indeed, that is the very theory of the Tenth Amendment, is it not? The enumeration of powers in the Tenth Amendment and the failure to have anything like a Ninth Amendment uh, coupled with that means that only those powers belong to the government. Uh, the government has only those powers. And so what you've got then is uh, a, a constitution and a bill of rights that enumerate some of our rights, leaving the rest unenumerated, because you cannot enumerate all of our rights. There are an infinite number of rights that we have, right? To get up in the morning when you want to, the right to wear a hat, Etc. Etc. And so this is the way you want to think of the Ninth Amendment. It is not as though there are these rights to be enforced and these others to be selected by the legislative body. No, that first of all leaves the legislative body as a, a as an interested party, uh, and secondly. It means that there's a sharp distinction between the enumerated and the unenumerated rights. No, they are of the same kind. In fact, if you want to read a book about this at the state level, there's one coming out on the 9th of next month from um, uh, Anthony Sanders of the Institute for Justice about state baby Ninth Amendments. I've got a review of it, which will come out uh, next month and the date of the release of the book at Law and Liberty. Uh, in fact, Illinois has, those of you who practice in Illinois, Illinois has a baby Ninth Amendment. And uh, Sanders makes the point throughout that when these amendments were incorporated, 66 times in our history, today more than two-thirds of the states have baby Ninth Amendments. Those who wrote them made it clear that these are no different from other rights, these unenumerated rights, and they meant for them to be protected by the judiciary. But the judiciary has failed from a consideration, they've essentially, whenever they've done it, they've appealed to uh, a, a, their safety zone and done it in the name of a substantive due process rather than in the name of the Ninth Amendment, whether federal or state. Okay, now we have our the Constitution completed, at least in broad outline. 
We lived under it more or less for 150 years as a theory of limited government designed to secure rights, both enumerated and unenumerated. It wasn't perfect. It took, uh, there was the oblique recognition of slavery. The framers knew the institution was inconsistent with our founding principles. They hoped it would wither away in time. It didn't. It took a civil war. And the passage of the Civil War Amendments, which provided for the first time federal remedies against our state violations by defining citizenship, federal and state, and providing <clears throat> that no state shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States and deny the equal protection, deny, deprive us of life, liberty, and property uh, uh, without due process of law or uh, deny us the equal protection of the laws. The Privileges or Immunities Clause, as you doubtless all know, was rendered um, uh, null and void in the infamous slaughterhouse cases. And so we have to find out what are the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. There we go back to our theory of the Constitution. And we find that basically it's a Constitution that is designed to provide us uh, with, uh, to, with uh, to, to carry out the enumerated powers and do the few other things uh, that are justified with reference to the general welfare of the United States, namely those public goods that I spoke about earlier. Okay, now we're in a position where we get to uh, the great watershed in constitutional history, namely the Progressive Era, which fundamentally uh, rejected the original understanding of the Constitution. Wilson thought it a straitjacket. He was right. It is a straitjacket. It's designed to limit the powers of the political branches and, after the 14th Amendment, the states as well. The progressives were hailing from the elite universities of the Northeast. Uh, they were looking to uh, German models of good government. They were social engineers. Uh, who wanted to use government to solve all manner of social and economic problems. Some of the things they did were perfectly understandable and good, as dealing with, for example, corruption in city governments, but that has uh, returned, as you folks in uh, Illinois know only too well. Um, and so uh, what, what the progressives were doing, as I said, was basically rejecting the original understanding of the Constitution. But the courts, to a large extent, not entirely, stood athwart their efforts in the early decades of the 20th century, most of which efforts took place at the state level. But when we get to the um, election of uh, Roosevelt in 1932, their focus switched to the federal level. And during the first four years of the Roosevelt administration, uh, one program after another of that administration was found to be unconstitutional, which led to the election of 1936, uh, the landslide election, after which Roosevelt unveiled his infamous court packing scheme as threat to add six new members to the Supreme Court. Well, there was an uproar in the country over this, not uh, even uh, only two states had gone for Roosevelt. Uh, not even Congress, or the House of four to one, would go along with the House. Four to one Democrat would go along with it. Nevertheless, the court got the message. It was the famous switch in time that saved nine. And it began rewriting the Constitution without benefit of constitutional amendment. And they did it in three main steps. In 37, it eviscerated the doctrine of enumerated powers, the very foundation of the Constitution in a pair of cases that uh, dealt with uh, the General Welfare Clause and the Commerce Clause, respectively. And then in 1938, it bifurcated the Bill of Rights in the Caroline Products foot, uh, famous footnote uh, four case uh, and the Caroline Products ca uh, case, uh, giving us a bifurcated theory of judicial review and a bifurcated theory of, um, of rights. Uh, where did it get this theory? It wrote it from a whole cloth, as Bernie Segan, uh, I once asked him, uh, Bernie, where did, uh, where did the court find this idea of bifurcated rights? Uh, he said, on page three of the Constitution. Um, 
And so, this is one of those rare classes that if you got that joke. <laughs> and I commend you. This is Chicago education, right? <laughs> anyway, uh, and then in 1943, with the floodgates open to the modern redistributed and regulatory state. Uh, Congress, of course, could not micromanage all the legislation it was passing, so it started delegating ever more of its powers to the administrative, I guess uh, uh, you heard yesterday uh, from uh, Scalia, uh, the younger, uh, about the issue of administrative law, so I won't go with much of that with you, uh, the various deference doctrines and so on and so forth. And so the floodgates were now opened up fully. Um, and uh, the court was, as I said earlier, deferential. Uh, until we get to the mid-50s, and it began uh, finding rights, uh, many of which were long overdue to be found, as I said before, but others of which were, uh, were fundamentally, um, um, they were not meant to be included even among our unenumerated rights. And nowhere more so, dare I say, as I venture into this uh, minefield, uh, was that more clear than in Roe v. Wayne, which, as Ruth Bader Ginsburg said in her Madison lecture in 1992, should have been left to the states because it involves a police power question and the general police power does not belong to the federal government, it belongs to the states. And so now it is back there. But in his, in his opinion, uh, Justice Alito latched on to the right point, namely, abortion is different from these other cases that we have decided. Griswold, the right to sell and use contraceptives. Uh, Lawrence v. Texas, the right of homosexuals to engage in whatever sexual practice they wish to in the privacy of their home and the like. It's different. Why? Because it involves a question of whether there is another person there whose rights are being protected by an anti-abortion statute or ignored by a case like Roe v. Wade. Why is this different? Think about Griswold. When Connecticut criminalized the sale and use of contraceptives, whose rights under its police power were being protected by that statute? No one's right. When Lawrence v. Texas, the Texas statute criminalizing homosexual behavior was homosexual sodomy was passed. Whose rights was it protecting? Whose rights were being violated by Lawrence? Well, just an aside, when they originally thought about that issue in the legislature, they prohibited um, sodomy generally, but then it dawned on them, wait a minute, that'll catch too many of us. And so <laughs> it, was, it, it, it was reduced to homosexual sodomy. Ah, now that was a little bit. Um, so the, the idea is that when you look at the issue from, the pers from this perspective, what you need to do simply is this. The plaintiff has to go into court and make a prima facie case that this statute restricts his liberty. And then the burden shifts to the government. To, uh, th then that's all he has to do to establish his prima facie case. He doesn't have to find a right in the Constitution. It then shifts to the government to show what the rationale is for it. What rights are you protecting under this uh, use of the police power? If they can come up with nothing, then they're out of court. In fact, I will give you a case that it was decided at the trial level rather recently by Tim Sandifer, a good friend of mine, uh, who was faced with a, a challenge brought by two young men who had just graduated from the University of Kentucky in uh, Lexington uh, and wanted to start a, um, a moving company. Well, and they did, but they were challenged immediately by, quote, 
the other moving company. And why do you think? Because they were in violation of a convenience and necessity statute. In other words, we already have one moving company in this area. We don't need another one. So Tim uh, put that before the judge. The judge said, absolutely, the rationale for this is simply protection of the resident uh, uh, moving company. And so that ended that way. And so I will conclude simply by saying that um, if we think about the Constitution as establishing a presumption against government, and therefore requiring the government to justify what it does, we will have a principle room for distinguishing or for understanding how we protect not only enumerated but unenumerated rights as well because they are of a piece. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Right, Dr. Professor Helmholtz. Professor Helmholtz. Well, the, um, the main thing I, I want to, my main reaction is uh, to praise the University of Chicago. Gee, when I got out of uh, the university, uh, I, I knew the fight song and I knew how to deal with a hangover. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that's where, when, where fun goes to die. <laughs> but, but I sure couldn't have uh, matched anything even close to the learning that uh, uh, Roger has, has given us today. Uh, however, I do read the newspapers, and uh, I want to just ask him what he, how he reacted to uh, a couple of things that uh, have been going on now. Um, and the. Uh, the first one is Adrian Vermeule's book uh, on, on constitutional law. Adrian takes the view, I don't know if you've, you've seen it or, or not, but he takes the view that the, uh, the legislature has a duty and has a privilege to uh, enforce moral principles uh, and to, uh, to establish rules that are founded upon um, the common good of the uh, nation and, and the people. Uh, so I want to ask our speaker what he thinks of that. Is that, uh, is that a form of what he's talking about? It seems to me not, uh, but uh, I'm not sure, and, and I'd like to have him respond to that. The other comes from a, a recent experience of mine um, at, a, at a meeting of the Wilson Society, uh, and it deals with the current litigation of, of admission standards at Harvard University and other other universities. I'm sure you're all familiar with that. Uh, and as you know, Harvard seeks to promote societal diversity, uh, societal diversity and inclusion by counting the race of uh, the minority people as a favorable factor in the admissions decision. Uh, and the result of that being that the Asian applicants uh, with higher test scores and uh, ability are excluded uh, in favor of black uh, applicants. Now, this came up at a recent meeting of the James Wilson Foundation that I, that I attended. And what we had was a, um, a series of people uh, denouncing the, um, the um, decision uh, by Harvard and, and arguing that it had to uh, stop. Now, being a little bit of a contrarian, I, say, uh, I spoke up and said, well, wait a minute. Shouldn't Harvard have a freedom, a basic freedom to choose who they want? Uh, and uh, every speaker uh, but one uh, spoke against that, and I was the one. Uh, and, and you know that this is a matter of litigation, and uh, I, I suppose the thought was that Harvard's uh, practice was overtly discriminatory and had to be stopped. So, and that was the, uh, uh, what I wanted to c contrast with the possible freedom of Harvard to do what they wanted. Uh, and um, so what I wanted to, uh, to contribute to the, uh, the session this, af this afternoon was simply to ask uh, our speaker, who's got a lot more learning than I do on this uh, subject, what, what he thinks of those two uh, issues, the uh, Adrian Vermeule's book and the uh, litigation now before the Supreme Court about racial preference. Um, and so if I can just leave it at that, we'll have some so we have some time to um, have questions from you all. Well, um, 
I'm, I'm delighted to address those questions with respect to Vermeule. Uh, he is a natural law man. I'm a natural rights man. And therein lies a big difference. Um, you can do no better uh, than wade through Will, uh, Will Bode and Steve Sachs' uh, piece on their critique of Vermeule. Uh, it is dense uh, beyond belief, but it is wonderful, uh, uh, wonderful ex exegesis on the Vermeule uh, problem. Um, there is a certain, one, one would think that there's a certain similarity between what I said and what Vermeule is saying, only because we think that, that um, morality is built into the Constitution. The thing is, I built, built into it a lot less than Vermeule does. He has this common good uh, conservatism. Common good is one of those uh, locutions that you can put into anything that you want. Uh, it is absolutely vacuous uh, or, or, or full uh, in that way. And one of the reasons I distinguished rights and values earlier on was to draw exactly that point. Namely, the Constitution is indeed written to secure our liberty in all of its manifestations. Uh, in the classic that theory of rights sense, that's why I wrote my dissertation back in the 1970s across the Midway, to draw that kind of distinction. Um, now, with respect to, um, uh, to um, and of course, then too, Vermeule sets up a straw man in his attack on originalism. Uh, I'm an originalist uh, like Will and the others. Uh, but um, uh, originalism, if it deals with uh, finding out the meaning of phrases that are sel themselves freighted with uh, the theory of morality that I set forth with respect to the theory of rights, that's perfectly In other words, all that amounts to is saying the founders got it right as a matter of morality. Um, so when government goes on uh, addressing various uh, issues of good, then you start to get into problems because we disagree about the good. Now, the second question was with respect to the litigation about the uh, oh yes, yeah, the, the from uh, the, um, well, this has been the, this anti-discrimination body of law, which is vast today. Uh, originated, of course, in 1964 with the Civil Rights Act. And I, with Epstein, are in, uh, of the view that probably we had to, at that time, include private entities as well as public in order to break the back of systematic racism in the South. But we hope that it wouldn't have to last forever. Uh, as <clears throat> Senator Day O'Connor famously said, 25 years, we hope we won't be rid of that. That was in the Grutter decision, the University of Michigan case. Uh, in an ideal world, Harvard, being as private, could discriminate any way it wanted to. It's complicated by its receipt of gobs of federal money. Strictly speaking, that should not count. In other words, if the government, the government cannot say to a private party, we will give you money for this particular project if you give up one of your constitutional rights, like the right to uh, freedom of association. Uh, that's an unconstitutional condition. It can occur only in cases where you're dealing with national security type questions. But in the ordinary run-of-the-mill cases, no. That's the way it would be decided, ideally. With respect to public organizations down at the University of Illinois, there they belong to the public. They cannot discriminate on the basis. Uh, they cannot engage in invidious discrimination. They can engage on such relevant criteria as fitness for the position, whether it's being 
as a policeman or a student in a university. And so that's my short answer to that question. We have lost the distinction between private and public far too much uh, in the intervening years. And it's a tragedy because it comes up nowhere more clearly than in the religious liberty cases, the, uh, the um, uh, cake maker cases, the florist cases, and so forth. And so we have a state of affairs where a statutory right trumps a constitutional right. Think of how upside down that is. OK, questions? Well, thank you, Professor Hummels, Dr. Blunt. We've got time for a couple of questions. Yes, Matt. So my question was about the substitute, substantive due process cases before Roe, yeah. which you distinguished on the basis of harm to individual versus yeah. private individual, individual harm. Uh, my understanding of the police powers is that they not only extended to health and safety, but also morals. Yeah. And that in a lot of the early colonies at the time of the mountain, when you could have prosecution for things like blasphemy, because there was a belief that allowing pernicious blasphemous thoughts would threaten the moral order of the community. Yeah. Um, what distinguishes those cases? Or okay. do you just disagree with my characterization? Of no, your characterization was spot on. Thank you for the question, because it's. Uh, obviously, as I said at the outset, we're not going to cover all, everything, Professor Helmholtz and I, uh, in this little time that we have here. So I'm, I want the idea is to get you thinking longer and harder about this, and that's exactly the kind of question to ask. The police power is, as you said, uh, securing our rights and providing for the health and welfare, which is the regulation necessary to secure our rights and morals. And there is where you start to get into difficulties. Now, I'm not an absolutist on this. I would allow, for example, laws prohibiting the wanton cruelty to animals or walking down the public streets naked. I suppose it matters who's walking down the street naked. <laughs> That's another issue. Um, but you, you're on a slippery slope when you're doing morals legislation. Uh, think of sumptuary laws. You mentioned the colonies. These are laws which prohibited loud uh, 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 apparel. Uh, I came here with a tie that has the University of Chicago logo on it. I thought I would, you know, this was if I could wear this any place, it would be here. And but but in the colonial time, that might have been thought to be ostentatious and uh, therefore uh, uh, actionable. And so, yes. I will allow, I would allow some legislation in this area, but you have to be very careful and set your criteria out very clearly with a, with a presumption in favor of liberty. That's the way I would answer that. We have time for one more question. What, is that all the time for you? I thought we could go to 1230. Uh, 118, unfortunately, but that's the last okay, minute well, here. Yeah. Well, we got the, yeah. uh, three minutes. Yes, in the back. Oh. Let me just put this on the table because I think it's implicit in a lot of Speak up. I think this is implicit in a lot, in a lot of what you were saying. But uh, the proposal, uh, substantively, is basically to revive Locke, right? And um, so to speak up. The Reviving Locke. Revive Locke. Yeah. Substantively, what you're saying is to revive Locke. Oh, yes. Locke. 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 Of course. <laughs> okay, and the, I mean, is that an open question? <laughs> are, we, are we men and women of reason? Okay, and, and, uh, and the reason why I believe that it's uh, more judicially workable this time around is that uh, we're enlightened people at the University of Chicago, and now we have, we have a defined set of criteria. Is this the point? Do, do we have a Defined set of criteria. Yeah, uh, who, who's who's injured by that statute? It turns out that that was a sweetheart deal, and um, I mean litigation rather. Uh, the, the 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 workers were uh, sleeping in the factory while the baker while the bread was being cooked, uh, and that, so you know this was just nothing more than a union uh, a support piece of legislation. So that's a short answer for that. Oh, I just a quick question about uh, federalism. Yeah. Um, I was curious, 
sort of in light of, uh, you're talking about decisions that began rolling back some of the excesses of the Warren Court. Rodriguez comes to mind, Justice Powell's opinion about education and the Equal Protection Clause. And I was wondering if you think a lot of people view state constitutions and state governments as less threatening to liberty because of the ability to choose. States, and I'm just curious, based on your theory, perhaps that's not a legitimate or not as defensible? Uh, well, if you look at Clayton Pollock's uh, book, which we published and I edited, we called it uh, Grassroots Tyranny. It's about what goes on at the state level. Most of these issues, of course, involve state level. And you mentioned the before uh, the, the New Deal. Well, of course, we've got cases like uh, 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 Pierce v. Society of Sisters in, in Meyer v. Nebraska, uh, which are perfectly legitimate decisions. In fact, I will conclude with the story I was told Joe last, last night. I was in the Mayflower Hotel and uh, in the big, big hallway there, not at a FedSec event, and there's Scalia. And so uh, I, he and I never met except to argue. And um, so yeah, I, I, we started out, and I, was, I went on my favorite subject, the one today, and unenumerated rights, and we're going back and forth, and a crowd is gathering around us. He's there with his wife, and he, uh, and I, I'm thinking to myself, oh boy, I'm going to get this guy. Strict Catholic that he is, I'm going to throw at him Pierce v. Society of Sisters. Those of you who don't know, that's the challenge to the Oregon statute that, pro that required parents to send their kids to a government school, not to a parochial school. I said, Nino, I bet you would have been on the other side of, of Pierce v. Society of Sisters. I would, he said. I turned in one and I said, you're a saint to put up with this man. <laughs> she said, you're right. <laughs> so, but anyway, he, come, he uses substantive due process as, uh, when, he, when it's useful. However, you know, it shouldn't be substantive due process. The privileges or immunities clause was what was meant to be the source of these kinds of rights. And so now we're up against slaughterhouse cases. And look, I haven't even gone into, I've given you the outline of a theory of the Constitution that explains how it is that we are now in a world where people are demanding more goods and services than they're willing to pay for. So what do we do? We borrow and we borrow. Today, the federal debt is $31 trillion and growing. Social Security is due to run dry to the trust, so-called trust fund in less than 10 years, Medicare in five years. All of this should be of great interest to you because you are the ones who are funding my social security. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>